I do, let's, now you're on notice. Uh, let's uh, get us uh, started for today's meeting. Before introducing our speaker, I wanted to remind you of the events at the center next uh, week. On Tuesday, Nick Huggett, who is a center visiting fellow uh, this semester, is going to be giving a lunchtime talk at noon. And the title of this lecture will be Missing the Point in Non-Commutative Field Theory. On uh, Friday next week, we will have another talk in the philosophy of uh, linguistics given by uh, Ryan Neft, who is a center visiting fellow this semester and who will be talking about structures and the special sciences, the case of um, linguistics. Now, it's uh, my uh, real pleasure today to introduce our speaker, my colleague at Pitt, uh, Kate Stanton, who is in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh. She's assistant professor there. She got her PhD from Yale, uh, from the Department of Philosophy. Uh, and she works in the philosophy of linguistics, but also in linguistics and cognitive science. Uh, she's, uh, but I also found out she has interest in issues related to privacy laws. Uh, and uh, I'm actually uh, uh, interested in that question, but that's the topic for another day. Uh, um, uh, Kate has published in, on various topics in uh, um, uh, linguistics and in uh, philosophy. And uh, one uh, um, small interesting, I was talking to her a minute ago about that, uh, that I found on her CV is that she speaks Hindi and uh, um, uh, a bit of Tamil as well, uh, which actually we'll uh, 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 hear a little bit about in her talk today, which is going to be about multiphase semantics and contrastive coordination. Get uh, the floor is yours. Hello. Um... Gosh, I can't, I can't see everyone. Um, that's disorientating. All right, so um, multi-phase semantics uh, and cross contrastive coordination, evidence from uh, Hindi Urdu. Um, I'm just checking, can everyone, you can see my screen, um, is this- We can, just, we can, it's working just well. Super duper. Actually, you know what, you're all here for a kind of really special uh, occasion, which is the first time I've ever used a slideshow presentation. Um, so let's see how that goes, right? I've somehow managed, I've made it this far without ever using one before. Um, so multi-phase semantics and contrastive coordination. Um, I'm Kate Hazel Stanton. This is not the University uh, of Pittsburgh, but that's okay. We're in the right time, uh, right place. Uh, let's go. Okay, so I'm about to ask you to spend 45 minutes listening to a really innocuous corner of natural language, right? I'm about to ask you to listen about a semi-idiomatic construction type and you might have never heard uh, an instance of the version of this construction type that occurs in your first language. Uh, so I thought I'd probably better start out by, you know, motivating that a little bit. Why am I gonna ask you to do that, right? What's the big picture? So the motivation for this project, which is actually the motivation for my research more broadly, is that I think we need to pay a lot of attention to robust low frequency patterns uh, in natural language, okay? Um, so the reason that we need to pay attention to robust patterns in low frequency data in natural language is that I think that it can cause us to call into question the descriptive adequacy of the representational tools that we've heretofore used. Um, why is that? Well, the reason is that, you know, even though the representational tools that we've heretofore used might be very good for the kind of smaller fragment of high frequency, highly general constructions and uh, phenomena that occur in natural language that we've kind of based our prior work on, um, our obligation as linguists and as uh, philosophers uh, of language and maybe philosophers of science extends even further than that. So we really need to be looking at how to characterize interpretative regularities in natural language. And as we throw the net wider and wider out to capture a bigger and bigger portion of the data, um, we might find that we do get like odd fishes in there that are going to cause us to question the fundamental assumptions that we made when we started out with that restricted data set. So expand the fragment, Montegovian slow Logan, um, catch the small odd fishes and see what they do for us. And I think this construction really is one of those small and odd fishes. 
Um, Kavya Sento, uh, let the buyer beware. Um, I am going to be assuming some form of mentalism about uh, linguistics and about formal semantics in this talk, right? So um, I'm going to be assuming in particular that what we're doing as formal semanticists is trying to represent the workings of the cognitive system at some level of abstraction. Um, and I'm going to be doing that because I'm going to be saying that semantics gets involved in a process called reanalysis and reanalysis is an online cognitive process of meaning reassignment, right? Um, so I know that's not universally the most popular uh, opinion uh, in informal, in a certain brand of formal semantics. I'm happy to stand by it, um, uh, but I will certainly take questions about that uh, at the end uh, if you're not happy with the kind of mentalist backdrop of the talk. Okay. So here's the roadmap. Um, it goes like this. First of all, I'm not coming into this talk assuming that you um, have ever taken a semantics class or you have any background in semantics and pragmatics. So I'm going to start off by laying out some of the basic assumptions. And a kind of FYI is that as we go on through this talk, the basic assumptions are going to be sufficient. Even when we hit a little bit of lambdas uh, later on down the road, if that's not familiar stuff, then you can elide over it and you'll still get the basic point. Um, I'm going to introduce semantics and pragmatics, then I'm going to introduce you to a kind of pair of contrasting positions. One of them is single phase semantics, which I'll claim is currently the dominant picture. Um, in fact, I haven't seen any picture that's, that's not that. Um, and then multi phase semantics, which is what I'm going to argue for um, with my uh, constructions. Uh, then we're going to move on to co contrastive coordinative constructions more broadly. I'm going to introduce what those are. Um, and we're going to take a really kind of like fast whip around a range of languages, because what I found doing work on Hindi Urdu version is that people have just been saying to me, there's a version of this in my language. Um, so if there's a version of this in your language and it works slightly differently, um, I'm super interested to hear about that in the questions, right? So definitely let me know, hey, I've got this and it works slightly differently. Um, so then once we've got the whiff around the languages, we're going to move on to the case study, which is going to be um, the bulk of the talk. Um, how is this construction working in Hindi Urdu? Um, and then finally, um, uh, totally stick around for number five, because I'm going to thank you and I'm going to stop talking. Um, okay, so let's go. Okay, what is semantics? Um, I'm going to take semantics to be the study of the conventional assignment of meaning to syntactic form. Uh, sometimes that's known as the study of encoded meaning. Um, often we say that the, inter the uh, conventionally determined form meaning pairs um, are conventions that are either linguistic conventions or interpretation conventions. So I'm in this walk going to call them interpretation conventions. So that's the conventional mapping of meaning to form. Okay, so formal semantics is a subdivision, is a subpart of semantics proper. Um, formal semantics focuses on the compositional aspect of meaning. So the way that part meanings like cat and dam combine to make whole meanings like the meaning of uh, dam cat, right? Uh, and so block caps there is just representing the meaning instead of the, the text. Another distinction that's going to be important in this talk is the distinction between descriptive and expressive meaning. Descriptive meaning encodes uh, what we call truth at content, so content that can either be true about the world or false about the world, depending on the way the world is. And that's represented truth conditionally, um, and I've given you like a little uh, uh, kind of semantic representation of some truth conditions there. You can read those double brackets as the meaning of, it's just a representation of the interpretation function. So the meaning of cat relative to a model and an interpretation function, and cat there is interpreted as a predicate, right? cat of x because we say that something is a cat so the meaning of cat is one just in case uh x, sorry the meaning of cat of x is one just in case x is a cat um, so the way that's going to work is it's going to look at the model it's going to look at all the individuals in the model and it's going to say one yes if an individual is in fact a cat and zero no if it's not so it's just going to kind of like build a big set the set of the cats in the model we're equating the meaning of cat cat of x cat as a predicate um, with the kind of set of cats in the model right so that can be true or false about the world is the basic, uh, the basic claim there. 
Uh, expressive meaning works in a slightly different way. Expressive meaning uh, encodes affect. So instead of encoding truth apt content, it's encoding a kind of affect, a speaker affect usually. Um, and it's represented not truth conditionally because we're not talking about that truth app content. It's represented use conditionally. So let's take a word like damn, again, interpreted as a predicate. So like damn something like damn cat. So damn of X relative to a context of use is check mark is felicitous. Um, so it's properly used. Remember, we're not in the domain of true and false here. Uh, we can be you know, felicitous in using our expressives or infelicitous. So damn of X relative to a context of use is felicitous if and only if at the actual context, you know, we're actually in a context, which, which is an element of the set of contexts such that the speaker feels mildly negative towards X at that context. So if I say damn cat, uh, then that's felicitously used just in case I, the speaker, feel mildly negatively towards the cat, uh, which is supplying X there uh, at the context. Okay. So that's my whirlwind tour of uh, semantics and hopefully that should be enough to uh, tide us over in this talk. Uh, pragmatics is kind of like the complement of semantics, right? So where semantics was the conventional assignment of meaning to form, pragmatics is the non-conventional assignment of meaning to recover speaker meaning at context. So pragmatics is deeply a matter of contextual interpretation, speaker meaning recovery at the context, uh, and it's not governed by conventions. Uh, it draws on world knowledge, um, so it's going to draw on your encyclopedic knowledge, knowledge of the context, and so on, and it might do so inferentially. In this talk, I'm not going to get into the debate about whether pragmatics must be inferential or whether it's always inferential. Um, I'm going to leave open the door for non-inferential supplementation of world knowledge, um, but the claim here is that there must be some draw on world knowledge um, uh, for, uh, for, we, for us to be in the domain of pragmatics. Um, and so what jobs can pragmatics do? Um, Broadly three jobs, right? So pragmatics can disambiguate meaning in context. So it can tell us, are we talking about the financial institution bank or are we talking about the side of the river bank? Uh, it can supplement meaning in context. So we're all familiar maybe with uh, conversational implicature. You know, someone asks me, um, is so-and-so a nice person? I say, what a lovely day. Um, the implicature there is that I want to change the topic. It's inappropriate for you to be speaking ill of somebody. Um, so pragmatics world knowledge, knowledge of kind of uh, the way that we talk about one another and what's appropriate at a context is going to supplement an implicature in that case. Um, and then finally, the third category that I want us to focus on going forward, uh, which is the category of pragmatic reanalysis. So pragmatics can help us reanalyze meaning in context, by which I mean it can help us to make contextually specific meaning changes. Uh, what we're gonna do when we're reanalyzing is we're gonna take a meaning, take the default meaning, which might be given to us by the semantics, um, and it's gonna we're gonna locally modify it in order to uh, help retrieve speaker meaning at the context. We're gonna represent that by local modification to the semantic value. Um, so let me talk you through an example of reanalysis so we get the big picture um, uh, in small. So say uh, we're at a restaurant um, and I kind of look over at your salad and I say, do you want food or are you happy with salad? Um, there's a local implication there that in this context, salad is not food. I'm not considering salad as food. Um, how are we getting to that? Uh, obviously, in the default assignment of food, salad is going to be uh, a member of the things that count as food in, in the kind of default model, right? Um, but disjunction, uh, as is well known in natural language, is uh, exclusive typically. And in order to maintain a sensible exclusive reading for this disjunction here, we're going to have to uh, narrow the extension of food locally so that it's not going to include salad. Uh, so the contrastive environment is inviting a contextual narrowing of food. Uh, so a little flow there, a representation of what's happening. We've got the semantic interpretation assigning the default meaning uh, of food, which is uh, another characteristic function like the one we saw of cat, right? It's just the set of food things in the model. Um, and then under reanalysis, under this pragmatic procedure, what we're doing is we're adding another filtering condition, right? So that filtering condition says that at this context, something is counting as food 
only if it satisfies this further condition is real food at the context. Um, and of course, what real food is, is going to contextually vary. So one context, it might be, you know, say if we're, um, we're non-veg, then it might be eating uh, a steak rather than a salad um, that I'm trying to convince you to do. Um, uh, but if we're all veg and I say, you know, food, then maybe I mean something like really robust, like, you know, something kind of very hearty and like chickpea based or something like that. Right. Um, so what's going to what's going to supplement that condition um, as real food is going to vary from context to context. So what I've just described to you um, is a picture in which reanalysis, this procedure, is fully pragmatic. It's all in the domain of pragmatics. Um, so reanalysis is a layer of post-semantic processing, um, and that's a kind of standard uh, assumption. And that makes sense, right? Because um, reanalyses are ad hoc in nature and they draw on world knowledge. Um, they vary from context to context and you need to know a bit about, you know, what your context is, you know, what your, your world assumptions are and who your speaker is in order to make that reanalysis supplementation. Um, like what counts as real food at the context. Um, and that's really unlike semantic knowledge, which is context insensitive. You know, the semantics is what an expression carries with it from context to context. You know, it's not supposed to be variant under contextual variation. Uh, and it's supposed to be, you know, determined by a linguistic convention, which we're all sharing, which we're all privy to, which we're not just opting out of um, at a particular context. So the picture we've got here is reanalysis as a procedure is fully pragmatic. And that leads to what I call single phase semantics. So the claim is that uh, semantic interpretation enters into speaker meaning recovery only once. Uh, at the compositional interpretation of the lexical items. Um, so that's really just to kind of sum up everything that we've said so far. Uh, disambiguation occurs, remember that's a pragmatic thing. Um, then we've got the interpretation and that's a semantic matter, the conventional assignment of interpretation to structure. Um, and then after that, we do any you know, modification that we need on the fly in order to retrieve speaker meaning at the context. So semantic centers at only one phase. And a little bit of a note, um, I'm not making a claim when I say phase about temporality. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, at uh, uh, T1 disambiguation occurs, T2 semantic interpretation occurs, and T3 reanalysis occurs. Um, I want to be kind of um, uh, a little bit um, non-committal there, um, although there are things to say, interesting interfaces with some work that's been done in psycholinguistics about the temporality of interpretation. So happy to talk about that at the end if you do want to. But that's single phase semantics. So, OK, um, I don't think that's right all the time. OK, what I'm going to argue for is a position called multi phase semantics. And that's fairly does what it says on the tin. Um, semantic interpretation can enter into meaning recovery more than once. Um, first at the compositional interpretation uh, of the lexical items, and then it can enter in later to constrain reanalysis. So when we've got pragmatic reanalysis going on, then we can get the emergence of interpretation conventions again that can direct that process of reanalysis and tell us, uh, give us concrete instructions uh, about how to modify the meaning uh, in the context. Okay, so hopefully that distinction is going to be clear uh, between single phase semantics, which is the default position, and multi-phase semantics, which is what I'm going to be arguing for. Okay, so on to actually arguing for it. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, a range of uh, uh, contrastive coordination constructions. Uh, first of all, let's do some ground clearing, right? What's a, a coordinative uh, or a coordination construction? Um, it's a construction that links multiple kind of same level properties. So determine a phrase, determine a phrase like a dog and a dog, um, sentence, sentence, the, the sun is shining and the rain is uh, not raining, um, verb phrase, verb phrase, at the semantic level, maybe property, property, or entity, entity. So we've got a kind of coordination uh, of same level uh, uh, properties. Uh, and a contrastive coordination is just one where the things that I'm coordinating, they've got to contrast in some way. I'm leaving it underspecified there what contrast means. It will become clear as we move on. 
Um, uh, one note here is that the constructions, I call the constructions that I'm going to look at coordinative in virtue of the surface presence of either coordinative syntax or uh, uh, syncategrammatic. Uh, Categorimatic, syncategorimatic material. Um, so we're going to have uh, the sentence internal conjunction being a coordinative conjunction there, and that's the reason. All right, so let's look at the construction. So in English, there's a version um, uh, that you may be familiar with uh, that looks a little bit like uh, an appositive, right? So if I, uh, my friend uh, Sheila has just become an astronaut, and I say, Sheila, an astronaut, and that's an instance. If somebody who I assume shouldn't be the best has been demonstrated to be the best, it's him the best. And if I'm someone is surprised or I'm surprised um, that I should count as a philosopher, then I would say me, a philosopher. Okay, so that's the construction as it occurs in English. And I'm calling it a positive-ish because a true positive is like this, right? Sheila, an astronaut, is going to the moon, right? So that's that would be in a positive. The positive would be that little clause in there that's kind of naming the, 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 the person next to it, the, the pronoun or the name next to it. So it's another way of referring there to, to Sheila. So the appositival uh, construction uh, has that structure. Um, I'm saying it's a positive-ish because uh, unlike a true positive, this construction in English does not embed. So you can't say Sheila, an astronaut, is going to the moon. That's marked. Um, that's much less good than Sheila, an astronaut, is going to the moon. So it's not a true positive. It's distinct from a true positive. I'm going to call it an appositive-ish construction. And what's happening there is that we're coordinating a name or pronominal expression with another uh, DP. Um, DP is there like an astronaut, the best, our philosopher, determiner phrases. If you're more familiar with kind of like noun phrase, then, then think noun phrase. I'm not picking that fight, that syntactic fight here. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the construction as it occurs in, uh, in English. Okay, Afrikaans, um, thanks very much to um, Olika and family for this uh, contrastive case. Um, so we get a really cool version of the appositival construction in Afrikaans, but there's a terminal focus particle, um, which you can think of as translating as kind of like rather. Um, so there aren't really focus particles in English, uh, true focus particles in English, um, but if you like, you can get a kind of rough sense by thinking about finishing the appositival construction with like no less or something like that, something that adds a bit of emphasis, introduces a bit of contrastive thinking. So you can say Sheila, an astronaut particle, um, sent from paper flowers, no less. Um, your son's wedding and I don't know about it, no less. So that third case is kind of marked in English. This is a case where we start to see that different languages have different expressive power with respect to this construction. And so the Afrikaans case is a little bit more permissive in what kinds of things we're gonna be able to coordinate by means of the construction. It's an interesting question, I'm happy to talk about it if anyone wants to, uh, about whether that's permitted or encouraged by the presence of that additional structural device, the focus particle. Okay, German. So I wanted to save German for last because in German we find a version of the construction um, that does something which the Hindi Urdu version does, uh, which is uh, coordinates via a sentence internal conjunction. Um, so in the first case, um, we've got Sheila, an astronaut, translated um, as either the appositival version, version Sheila, astronaut. Um, or with that, that conjunction there. And then uh, Rumfert doesn't actually translate as astronaut, it's like in space travel, right? So a little bit of a, a mistranslation there, but um, Sheila and space travel. Um, and then two there, John, clever, um, Petra and cooking. Um, so there we've got exactly the same thing happening, uh, but we've got the distinction. Uh, there are two options. One of them is with something like the appositival construction, and the other is with uh, an overt sentence internal conjunction. Um, so the sentence internal conjunction case is what we're going to be taking forward, but the basic profile is exactly the same. So one note before moving on about the German is that in many of those cases, certainly uh, in one and three, uh, we have uh, the sentence internal conjunction uh, option um, whilst attested being marked relative to the appositival construction. So it might sound a little bit worse or be less, uh, uh, less happy with the ears of, of native speakers, less likely to be produced, uh, uh, despite the fact that it's kind of there and, and it would be um, uh, like you know, native speakers will recognize it. Uh, thank you to um, Nikki and uh, Sasha. 
uh, for that thing. Okay, so let's let's dive in uh, to the Hindi Urdu case. Okay, a little note before beginning, um, the data uh, for this work and the data that I've showed you um, here is, have, is mainly coming from two basic sources. One is, I watch a lot of movies. <laughs> Um, so I'd, I've taken some direct quotation um, uh, from these movies. And the other is I work with some students um, who have been incredibly helpful um, at uh, Ashoka University um, uh, in constructing some of this uh, attested data, right? So the elicited data is all produced by students of Ashoka University and all of this movie data is kind of like tested against their intuition. So there's a little kind of methodological, um, ecological naturalism claim before I, before I jump in. Um, so basically what's happening in this construction is the same kind of thing as you saw in the German. We've got an affective uh, uh, output, so we're expressing some kind of affect um, via the use of a coordinating conjunction. Right? So uh, the first case, uh, the situation is such that, you know, somebody is trying to uh, laugh off the idea that somebody who seems kind of uh, uh, silly or ridiculous should be this renowned biz businessman, Sanjay Singhania, and says, you know, yeah, or Sanjay Singhania, like seriously, that guy is Sanjay Singhania. Um, so we've got that affective disbelief there, and then we've got this kind of contrast between that guy, how he seems, is ridiculous, um, and the bit renowned businessman, Sanjay Singhania. Uh, so in the second case, there's uh, a situation where a patient has come out of a hospital um, way too early, and it's just unexpected that they should come out this early. And, uh, and we get the line, Ek or katam, like, wow, treatment is seriously finished in one month. How, how is that the case? You know, it usually takes much longer. Uh, the third is like, there's like a mob boss. The mob boss is, has been asked to apologize for something. There's kind of immense scorn that comes with the delivery of this line that I should ask for forgiveness, seriously. Uh, finally, this is one of the elicited cases, elicited data. Um, this came from a couple of my participants. They all, for some reason, generated the same sentence uh, uh, when asked to generate an instance of this construction type. Um, like, I'm crazy, seriously? Like, dismissal, like, I'm not crazy at all. Um, a couple more cases, uh, one of reprimand, so the affect being expressed here is reprimand, your son's wedding and I don't know about it. So this is two friends who should have been keeping each other up to date and uh, the wedding of one son has occurred and the other one hasn't been informed. So there's a sense of immense reprimand and uh, a violation of the obligations of friendship that's, that's brought along with five. Uh, six, uh, both from a movie and one of the elicited responses, um, Shadi or say like I should get married to him, really? Um, and then seven uh, is one of puzzlement. So somebody smells a, a nice smell and, and the smell appears to be coming from paper flowers and that doesn't make sense. Uh, so they say, like, how is a fragrance coming from paper flowers? So in all of these cases, we've got um, uh, uh, the coordinating construction, con conjunction there um, and we've got uh, a couple of things happening. So let me run through a little bit slower what's happening with the data. The construction is targeting a recent update to the common ground uh, in which the arguments of the conjunction have entered into an actual or implicit predication relation, okay? Um, so what's happening uh, in, say, this case, uh, Shadi or Isse, um, people are thinking somebody has just suggested that they should get married to an unsuitable candidate, uh, and they're responding. They're responding with uh, derision, perhaps. Um, and so they're targeting a recent update to the common ground uh, in which there's been an actual or implicit predication relation. Um, and those two, uh, uh, those two conjuncts have been linked together in some way and we're responding to them in this case to reject. Uh, the leftmost conjunct typically gives the intuitive thematic subject, uh, the topic of the construction, um, so what the construction is about. So if you look here, um, uh, your son's wedding is coming here, marriage is coming here, nice scent is coming here. So that's what we're talking about. Um, and the other conjunct is a kind of comment on it. So to him that, you know, um, from paper flowers, and I don't know about it. So that's what's happening. Uh, we've got kind of an information structural division here between a topic and a comment on it. So there's reason to think that this piece of uh, uh, grammar is information structurally divided, okay? Um, and that's what's basically happening. 
So it's similar syntactically to uh, a coordinated DP. So a coordinated uh, DP is like a case like my friend and colleague is writing a book. Um, shout out to Ryan Neft um, for his awesome upcoming book. Um, but unlike coordinated DPs, um, it, those we can't uh, uh, embed this case. So just in the same way as the positive ish construction was only a positive ish, um, this coordinated DP construction is only coordinated DP ish, right? So it's similar, but it's non embedding. Oh no, I touched the thing. There we go. Uh, yeah. So what I'm going to say about it is, um, and and you know. Um, I'm not a syntactician. I'm very happy if there are syntacticians in the audience for them to tell, tell me way more interesting, detailed things about the syntax here. Um, but I'm going to stay at a pretty high level of generality um, and say that it's a non-embedding construction generated outside of the base grammar. So it's kind of idiomatic construction generated um, outside of the base there. Um, and, and so why might I want to remain uh, so high level in my syntactic description? Well, the reason is that I think that that level of description can be usefully generalized to the typological variants that we saw in other languages. Um, in each case, you know, we've got um, uh, uh, something which is a kind of coordinating construction, which is not uh, uh, embedding, um, that seems to be somewhat idiomatic. Um, and, and so that seems to be what's going on in every single one of those languages, despite the fact that exactly what that uh, coordinating construction um, is, is variable. So, you know, a positive, a positive plus, um, uh, you know, the subsentential conjunction um, and so on. And I'm very open to there being lots more ways of coming up with coordinating constructions and then having this feature um, uh, of uh, apply. Okay. So now I want to tell you about the most surprising thing, uh, perhaps about this construction, uh, which is that its interpretation uh, is contextually defeasible. Um, so the interpretations that I've offered you, that I've suggested to you, and that I've gotten from my participants, is only available with contextually appropriate framing. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean prosody. I've helped along uh, uh, in the you know uh, verbal realization by putting a particular prosodic contour. Shadi or isse, like you know a little bit of uh, prosody indicating score and falling contour there. Um, you can add a tag phrase uh, to. Uh, you can keep your prosody flat, but add a tag phrase to give you a bit of context. So shadi or isse you know, tell back, like, come on, come off it, um, you know, really seriously. So you add something like that, either to the beginning or to the end, um, and then you've got the appropriate context, you kind of unlock the interpretation that's desired, um, or with the appropriate contextual framing. Um, so what you really need there is a rich context supplying an environment in which you can retrieve the intended interpretation. And absent that, I've had tremendous difficulty getting the right interpretation from my participants and from people that I have showed this to, right? Um, what happens when you don't have the right framing? Um, well, absent contextual framing, the construction is misinterpreted as a joint DP. And I had this with two cases um, uh, really significantly. First of all, when I showed this elicited data, so native speakers came up with this data, Mar Bagel, uh, to uh, other uh, native speakers, they interpreted Bagel as a proper name. And they said, Bagel, which means crazy, um, who's that? They thought Mel Bagel was indicating me, a first personal pronoun, and uh, Bagel, a name instead of the property crazy. Um, that was a coordinated DP. And those are two individuals that I was then going to go and uh, go on and predicate about that they were going to do something. Um, similarly with Yer uh, Sanjay Singhania. Uh, so in this case, I uh, had this issue only yesterday. Um, so I, I had showed this uh, uh, written down to a native speaker and they interpreted it as uh, the Yer uh, there indicating that's a pronoun indicating one individual and Sanjay Singhania indicating another individual and they interpreted it as there being two individuals there, again, that I was going to go on and predicate of. Uh, when I said, no, no, that's not supposed to be it. They said, well, otherwise it's uninterpretable. Um, I can't really get a reading if it's not that. Um, so that uninterpretability uh, also came out with my participants for a couple of the other cases uh, uh, which I've given there. And if, even in the, the cases uh, uh, where I've elicited kind of like extra additional qualitative commentary on uh, uh, the Afrikaans case, for example, we got uh, people saying, well, this is uh, something that I need a lot of contextual uh, information about before I can retrieve this as an acceptable interpretation of this construction. 
Um, so it's contextually defeasible. Hold on to that, it's gonna be important later. So the proposal for the contribution, the meaning of this construction, something really general to say about this construction is that it's expressing two things, an affective reaction, remember that shock, disbelief, um, scorn, uh, happiness, hope, so on, um, to an incongruity judgment. So incongruity, I'll kind of cash out uh, now. Um, incongruity judgment, um, speakers report a sense of conflict between the, the first and the second conjunct, um, and the co a, commonly, uh, a common qualitative response, so I took a bunch of structured interviews about this, um, and a common qualitative response is that the property expressed in the comment just ought not to hold of the topic, so this ought not, these two things ought not to uh, be uh, uh, together. Um, and that idea that there's incongruity somewhere in the meaning is, is uh, supported by the availability of a range of discourse continuations explicitly referencing this relation, right? Um, so you can carry on if I say um, a scent, a fragrance coming from paper flowers, but fragrance can't come from paper flowers, then that sounds totally fine. Um, uh, but if I tried to carry it on uh, with uh, a continuation indicating uh, congruence, indicating that there was nothing strange uh, about the topic holding of the comments, so one part holding of the other, then that sounds really strange. If I say, that happens, it's really hard to, to make that sound right. Um, and so that, that kind of markedness and the inavailability of those continuations plus the availability of those continuations uh, that indicate uh, uh, incongruence, suggests that there's something going on that's pretty general about instant, from instances of, these construction, of this construction, uh, which is uh, an incongruity judgment. Um, the affective reaction part, uh, so we're all getting the feeling of affect that comes in uh, in each instance, that's the kind of dominant uh, uh, output of uh, uh, the construction, the dominant thing that you feel when someone says this, is some kind of affect being expressed. Um, so attested effective reactions um, can be grouped into three broadly delineated categories. Um, one is affect associated with expectation violation, like shock, surprise, uh, disbelief. Uh, another is varieties of rejective affect, so scorn, spite, sarcasm, dismissal. Um, and the third is affect that can be classed as forms of marveling, like awe and delight. So say you get a really um, uh, uh, attractive proposal and you're like, Shadi, I just say, like, really, I can get married to that person? Um, so so that uh, um, uh, an anecdote about uh, my participants, actually, um, that there was a big division when people were reading that uh, marriage and to him uh, or marriage and to her uh, datum uh, between those that had the marveling uh, interpretation and those that had the rejective affect interpretation. <laughs> okay, so let's go through the interpretation um, uh, piece by piece. So first of all, what we've got, syntax has yielded a non-embeddable coordinated, stru coordinated structure um, whose interpretation is partly idiomatic, right? This is gonna be important. So although the default meanings of the conjuncts are used, so um, shadi means marriage, isse means to him, and we're using the default, like the literal meanings of the conjuncts, um, the conjunction meaning can't be extracted from just the literal meanings alone, right? That's what is idiomaticity. Um, when we can't get the meaning that everyone's getting from the literal meanings of the parts, right? Uh, so um, you're going to get, you're not going to get from the literal meanings of marriage and to him, uh, you're not going to get um, the feeling of whatever affect is being expressed, you're not going to get the contrast, right? Um, a comparison, we do have a lexical item, and uh, it's also there in, in Hindi Urdu, uh, that does have a conjunction which is contrastive, and that's but, famously, okay? So it's not, we're not in the territory of but, right? From the literal meaning of and, we're not gonna get the meaning of but. So there's a gap between the literal meanings and the interpretation that's widely attested under the right context. Um, uh, so we've got to bridge that gap. Our interpretation is gonna be bridging that gap. So the usual options for interpreting uh, a semi-idiomatic or an idiomatic construction are the following. First of all, we've got disambiguation. For a very long time with idiomatic interpretation, that's been the standard line. The idea that we've actually got two lexically um, and structurally separate constructions, um, and we're just trying to find out which one uh, is being used at the context. So disambiguation is happening. 
Uh, in particular, in this case, the claim would be that the idiomatic construction is structurally a coordinated DP um, with an addition, and the addition is uh, a syntactic feature um, that accounts for the non-standard interpretation. Okay, what does that mean? That means that in the structure, in the syntactic structure, there's an extra little node, an extra little thing going on that says, um, I am a node in the syntax, um, I want to be interpreted with an affective reaction and an incongruity judgment um, and I am built in and so what you've got to do when you see an instance of that construction and I've given you that s1 s2 there um, is work out whether we're in structure one or structure two is the speaker giving me an instance of structure one where there's this additional little syntactic node that says interpret me with uh, contrast and affect um, or are we in uh, situation two where the speaker is saying you know this is yeah or Sanjay Singhania he and Sanjay Singhania are going to go somewhere the second uh, option for reana uh, for uh, interpreting uh, uh, an idiom uh, or semi-idiom is reanalysis. Um, that's an increasingly popular line, um, and I'm interested um, if anyone wants to uh, later talk about uh, the evidence for reanalysis and idiom uh, processing and interpretation. Um, so the idea here is that the idiomatic non-embedding construction is going to be interpreted with the default literal meanings. So we just take to take Shadi Odiste, marriage and to him, we give the literal, the default meanings to each of the constituents, and then we contextually supplement and reanalyze those constituents to tell us what the speaker is trying to communicate. So what we're doing is either in the one case we're disambiguating between two different structures that have fixed interpretations or in the other case we're assigning the default meanings and then we're reworking them pragmatically in context to arrive at the desired interpretation. All right so now what I'm going to do for the next portion of the talk is just hate on disambiguation. Disambiguation is not the way to go. So the first thing to say is that disambiguation occurs when one surface string can admit multiple passes. So if I say I saw the man with a telescope, is with a telescope modifying I or is it modifying the man? And you've got one surface string and it can take either of those passes. And when we disambiguate, we make a decision about which one the speaker is trying to use. Um, that's really problematic because it doesn't look like we have something that could, as a surface string, be multiply passed in, as uh, a coordinated DP um, or as an instance of the construction um, in most of the cases, right? So sha again, shadi or is marriage and to him, to him is not a DP, it's a preposition phrase. So we don't have a surface string that looks like a coordinated DP. And so disambiguation is off to a bad start. Um, and even if we could come up with some version of the disambiguation uh, opinion, the disambiguation root, um, disambiguation analysis is going to predict that if the structure is unambiguous, then interpretation should predict as normal, it should proceed as normal, right? So go back to I saw the man with a telescope. Once you know, even if you're looking at that guy and that guy has a telescope and someone utters that sentence, you know what pass is intended um, and you can straightforwardly interpret it. But remember, this construction is such that it's contextually defeasible in its interpretation. So disambiguation is under predicting that element, right? Um, note that reanalysis does a great job because reanalysis is a pragmatic process. It's an optional process. And you can just say, well, look, if it's not, uh, we're not in an environment where the, uh, the hearer has sufficient uh, awareness of speaker intention or awareness of the context to uh, start that reanalysis process, then we should get that contextual uh, uh, defeasibility property uh, coming out. So reanalysis is doing well there and disambiguation is doing very badly. Now let me convince you that reanalysis is the is the route we ought to take. So reanalysis is a really sympathetic analysis, not just for the reason that I suggested. It's a sympathetic analysis because the literal meanings of the con conjuncts are used and supplemented in a contextually variable way, which is just the kind of thing that reanalysis is made for as a concept, right? Um, so that even though the truth functional meaning of the copula um, of the conjunction, not copula, even though the truth functional meaning of the conjunction um, is uh, not used, um, so we're not introducing uh, a truth conditional uh, content from the conjunction there, because what we're getting out of the construction is an affective meaning, right? So we're not truth conditionally coordinating these things, we're saying something affective uh, by virtue of saying that, by uttering the construction. Um, so even though the truth functional meaning is not being used, um, it 
does contribute kind of co-instantiation. So there's a reason that we're finding that the conjunction is being used there because we're saying that these two things are coming together in some way. You know, um, the nice smell and the paper flowers are coming together. Um, the uh, uh, marriage and the thought of, you know, to, to that person, those things are coming together. Um, so there's something that's being used from the conjunction um, and also from the literal meanings, but we're getting additional supplementation of affect, supplementation of contrast. And so it's really seeming like the kind of thing that is well conceptually suited to reanalysis. Um, and finally, reanalysis account might help us explain what's going on with the cross-linguistic variation. So we can say something really general um, by saying, in exactly the same way as we, when we take a kind of uh, broader line with the syntax, uh, we can say something general about the typological variance. When we take a reanalysis uh, approach, then we can say something general about the typological variance. So what's common to all of these cases cross-linguistically is that a coordination relation of some sort is being extracted from the usual interpretation of an element of the syntax um, and it's being reanalyzed and in general what's happening is say the appositival construction is being reanalyzed and supplemented with affect and supplemented with this contrastive uh, feeling. Um, so we can say something quite broad from, from not taking the disambiguation approach but taking the reanalysis re approach and we can also very naturally talk about what's happening uh, to the parts and to the conjunction um, when we adopt the reanalysis approach. Okay, so now let me just talk you through the flow of interpretation and I'm going to offer. So first of all, we're going to get normal semantic interpretation. So the default meanings are going to be assigned to the parts. Then we're going to get pragmatic reanalysis. So the arguments of the conjunction are going to be converted to subject predicate structure. So reanalysis is coming in. I've just argued for a reanalysis account, and I'm happy for that to be fully pragmatic at this stage. So we're going to get a contextually variable modification of the arguments of the conjunction to get them up to subject predicate form. They're not going to be predicated of one another, because what's going to happen then is we're going to get semantics coming back, semantic reinterpretation. So semantics is going to introduce uh, a little bit of meaning, and I'm going to represent that with the standard formal tools, the, the lambda term, uh, that's going to do two things. It's going to introduce the presupposition, so the reaction, sorry, introduce the reaction to the incongruity judgment, and it's going to do that by introducing a presupposition. And it's going to introduce the expressive component of meaning um, by changing the type of the construction from descriptive to mixed expressive. Um, and don't worry about the details if you kind of aren't um, a semantics -y person. Um, I'll be just talking through this at both, at both layers there, all you can think of happening at this stage of semantic reinterpretation is that we're getting a bit of semantics coming back into the story and introducing the incongruity judgment um, and the expressive part, okay? Incongruity judgment is going in as presupposition, expressive part is going in as a kind of dominant meaning of the construction. And finally, um, what the semantics is gonna introduce is just only that some kind of affect is being expressed by use of the construction. Um, so we're gonna need a little bit of pragmatic finishing touches to go on after that. In particular, we're gonna need the selection of a particular kind of affect. So we've seen that's variable from context to context. Is shock being expressed? Is horror being expressed? Is re rejection being expressed? Is, um, ooh, all that's negative. Um, is joy being expressed? Is marveling being expressed? So that's gonna be pragmatically completed um, by selection at the context. Okay, okay, talk you through the structure. First stage, pragmatic reanalysis to subject predicate construction. As I mentioned, different work is going to have to go on uh, with different instances of the construction. So uh, in five there, we've got to contribute person information. Is the speaker the subject? You know, are we thinking about uh, the speaker's marriage? Or are we thinking about um, that person should get married to him? Or are we just thinking, or her, um, it's not uh, gendered in Hindi. Um, or are we thinking kind of super generally like, um, oh, the idea of that person getting married. Um, wonderful or awful. <laughs> um, and so we have to contribute all of that information. And we also have to uh, uh, contribute the conjunction, uh, the copular information, including tense, when are we talking about aspect um, and modal information? Are we talking about the mere possibility of the person getting married? Are we talking about like what's actually going to happen in the future and so on? So that stuff needs to be added um, and the uh, conjuncts need to be formatted into subject predicate structure. And then different work needs to go on for three. Um, I'll not talk us through that, uh, but much less work needs to, to go on there. Um, 
So can, variable case by case question, what needs to be done to reanalyze the conjuncts to subject uh, predicate form. Then we're gonna get semantics coming in. We're gonna insert uh, a type shifter. Um, a type shifter you can just think of as a little meaning changing device that we're gonna plop into the interpretation, right? So the type shifter I'm gonna call incong um, for incongruity. Um, and for reasons that I'm happy to discuss uh, in the questions, I'm gonna put it in there above the predicate. Um, so we've got the subject and the predicate, um, just above the predicate um, in the past tree, we're gonna put the type shifter. So we're gonna change the meaning um, above the predicate. So the type shifter is gonna do two jobs. First of all, it's gonna introduce the incongruity judgment as the presupposition. And second, it's gonna introduce the affective meaning as the use conditional content, the expressive content of the construction. Okay, so here's the picture of the incongruity judgment. Um, if you're uh, not familiar with this, uh, then the basic gloss is the following. Um, the content of the incongruity judgment here, hopefully you can see my cursor, is that in all worlds, uh, that are circumstantially like ours, that are kind of like our current world, that are compatible with the facts of our current world uh, uh, relative to some further specification. It's not the case that the predicate holds of the uh, subject, right? So it's not the case that P of X in all worlds that are kind of like ours, right? That's what's going on here. There's the composition ready form, the lambda term. Let me just talk you through an example to make that a little bit perspicuous. So let's return to So a fragrance is coming from paper flowers, fragrance and from paper flowers. Um, so in this case, uh, what's happening uh, is this is one, is true, if and only if, uh, in all of those worlds that are circumstantially like ours, they're compatible with the facts that are the facts of our present actual world relative to the biophysics of our world. So for those of you who are Kratzerians, this is uh, the, the modal flavor is coming in here. The ordering source is biophysical. Um, the best of those worlds, right? The worlds that are most like ours are such that uh, nice smell, kushbu, does not come from paper flowers, right? So ultimately what we're saying is, you know, in, in, the, in the worlds that are like ours, this doesn't happen. And a little note here um, that I won't have time to expand on right now, I'm going to take that to be um, almost exclusively um, root modality, right, circumstantial modality. So I don't think that this incongruity is epistemic in nature. Uh, I think it's circumstantial in nature. And, and please do ask questions if you don't think that is going to be so. Um, okay. And so the affective content, this is also going to be contributed by the type shifter. Um, this is going to do the job of shifting the meaning uh, uh, of the construction from descriptive to expressive meaning. Um, the idea is that it's just going to say the following thing, right? So it's it's felicitous, first of all, if the uh, the arguments, this is the arguments of the conjunction, have actually or implicitly been added uh, to the common ground in a kind of present predication relation. Um, and it's felicitous, uh, just in case it's well used, just in case the speaker's reaction to the incongruity of P of X at the context is a member of the set that I've called in Kong. And that set is just the set of affective reactions uh, that we can have uh, to the incongruity. Remember, I've said it's very, very broad. It's not like a mirative where we're just expressing surprise. It's going to target very, very widely uh, affective states or express very, very widely affective states of the speaker. And there we go, there's the composition ready uh, form. Uh, pragmatic finishing touches. Um, there's only one finishing touch. Once we've contributed both of those pieces of information, uh, we need to select among the set of affective reactions uh, that, we, that we require, right? So selecting among the set of uh, Inkong is gonna yield a particular affective reaction. Uh, there's a little picture of how it might look in practice for uh, him and Sanjay Singhania, Ye or Sanjay Singhania. Um, we, could, we don't need to work through this in detail. We can, of course, return to it if anyone wants to. But we've got um, the composition, uh, uh, the, this uh, Inkong operator entering here just above the predicate uh, and combining with the subject to yield the meaning for the uh, complex expression and being pragmatically resolved to yield uh, the uh, particular specific meaning, particular affect expressed at the context. 
Okay, so semantics kind of over, but wait, what? I just put semantics in reanalysis. Um, I've claimed that the insertion of the lambda term is semantic in nature, i.e. governed by linguistic convention. And now my uh, toll that I've got to pay is explaining to you why I think that is. So pragmatic reanalysis, which we started off with, that's a free process. That's not a process that has to go in a certain determinate way. Um, you know, when I say, uh, do you want salad or food? It's up to the context and up to me and up to you what we want to interpret food as. Um, you know, if I if if you are um, a, a, a rabbit, then I might mean something else by food than if you are uh, an elephant or a tiger or, a, you know, it really, really depends. There's, there's a lot of freedom in uh, in resolving uh, true cases of reanalysis. Um, but this isn't like this. What I've just argued for, what I've just suggested is happening, is that interpretation of the construction um, involves insertion of a cross-contextually constant core, okay? And that cross-contextually constant core is the following, the element of contrast, um, and also the affective contribution, right? So there's a cross-contextually constant thing that's happening in the process of, re of uh, pragmatic reanalysis, and that cross-contextually constant thing isn't doesn't look like it's pragmatic in nature, it looks like it's conventional in nature. Um, and, and so that's, that's, a, that's a big contrast. So that's, that's one of my main reasons for thinking that this is semantic in nature, this is convention driven in nature, it's not pragmatic. Um, the second thing that should tell us that we're in the domain of semantics and the domain of linguistic convention and not in the domain of pragmatics is that once the construction is licensed, um, the, the interpretation isn't cancelable, right? So, you know, go back to my um, uh, person who heard uh, Yeo Sanjay Singhania, him and Sanjay Singhania, and initially was completely convinced it was two separate individuals. Uh, they then kind of watched the, the, the sort of part of the movie where this occurs, and once they had the relevant context, then they could hear it, and you can't unhear it once you hear it, right? So the uh, construction, once it's licensed, um, is not cancelable. There's nothing that could have been added to that that would have caused uh, the individual to unhear the right reading. It just proceeds like normal semantic interpretation. Um, and, and so that's true of the effective part. It's also true of the descriptive presupposition, you know, the contrast part. So even if you think it's quite hard to contextually get rid of affect, um, uh, contextually you should be able to get rid of uh, descriptive content uh, and the descriptive presupposition there could, if it were uh, truly pragmatic um, with a sufficient contextual uh, enlargement be uh, uh, canceled, which you can't actually do. Okay. So if that analysis is correct, um, then what's happened here is the interpretation flow that I've just suggested um, is occurring has in fact occurred, right? We've got semantics coming in once, um, here we go, pragmatic reanalysis coming in after that, semantic reinterpretation coming in after that, and finally pragmatics coming in uh, to complete the story. And uh, as we see, we've got semantics entering at the first phase, and then again uh, at a later phase, which is uh, what I've introduced to you earlier on as a case of multi-phase semantic interpretation. Uh, so hopefully you're convinced. Um, there's a little bit more story. So initially when I was going to give this talk, I thought, well, okay, I, you know, I have some, some additional thoughts about how we should understand semantic competence uh, in light of multi-phase semantic interpretation. Semantic competence really just being, you know, knowledge of the interpretation conventions of the language. And I think we need to disrupt uh, our standard picture of uh, semantic competence in light of multi-phase interpretation. Um, it's only a 45 minute talk and I thought that would definitely push us uh, a little bit over. So hopefully um, if you are interested in talking about that, we can talk a little bit later on uh, in the questions. But for now, um, all I have left of my talk is the thing I promised at the beginning, to thank you. So thank you. Um, Tarchucks is in my dialect. Um, it's a very heartfelt thank you. It's a very familiar thank you. So excuse the familiarity. <laughs> I thank you very much for this really exciting talk. Uh, let me remind the audience how uh, things work. If you have a question for Kat, please go to the bottom of your screen and click on the Q&A button, and then I will promote you to the status of panelists, and then you can ask your question directly to, uh, to Kat, so I don't have to, uh, to be the middle person uh, uh, in the process. And so please go there and I will, it takes a few seconds for me to do that. All right.
All right. Colin, um, please go first. Great. Uh, Kate, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I, I have a question that um, stems from, I think, something you invited us to ask a question about. But I'm, it, it was the part of the talk where you were suggesting that the, um, and forgive me if I don't get the, the terminology quite right, but the, but the frame for the contrast is not something that's psychological or in the head. I'm not quite sure how you put this. Um, and I'm thinking of cases like the paper flower one where somebody might go, uh, you know, ascent from paper flowers really um, because they just actually don't know how the world is, right? So it turns out that in the actual world, scented paper is quite common and making paper flowers out of scented paper can happen. It may not be as common as, uh, as, a, as I'm making it sound, but, but there are going to be, it seems to me, lots of cases of this kind of construction where what's really at issue is the person's knowledge of the world that they're in rather than um, uh, uh, they're um, making some claim about um, uh, you know the world being a certain way. So, so, so doesn't that bring context right back in at the beginning um, of of the of the uh, of the analysis? Um, so, I'm I'm just curious what you what you think about that kind of uh, situation. Yeah, fantastic. Um, that's a great question. Um, I apologize for the shyness um, of, of the, my hands because the sun is coming in at a very strange uh, angle. <laughs> um, okay. so, um, so yeah, this is a great question. Um, a really natural reaction, particularly in light of what happens in a lot of the cross-linguistic cases, is to think that what's happening here is that there is some kind of um, epistemic attitude being conveyed by the construction. I am surprised or I am shocked uh, and so on. Um, so the reason to think, at least for me, that this is not the um, what's happening in the default case or the most general case, that really what's happening is that uh, the, the, you know, um, uh, what's happening or not the conjuncts ought not to be coming together in this circumstantial way um, is the following, right? So the, the construction in, uh, kind of exhibits uh, in many of its cases um, what I think of as an actuality indifference. That means that it's completely felicitous to utter an instance of the conjunction, even if you know that the subject applies of the predicate um, in many of these cases. Um, so if I say, uh, for example, um, you know, um, you, um, uh, your, your son's wedding and I wasn't invited, even if I've known that from a very long time, and you know that I've known that from a very long time, I can still utter that in, in reproach, in reprimand to deliver that affect, um, even though the kind of surprise value is zero there. And that's true um, for a lot of these cases. Um, a second reason is a little kind of bit more grammatical. So um, when we have um, epistemic modality, typically that's anchored to the time of the speech act, so it's anchored pretty high, um, and when I'm uttering uh, a, a kind of, in, you know, say a narrative or something like that, I'm conveying surprise. Um, if I say, uh, I had to have been in bed uh, by five o'clock, um, and that's supposed to be interpreted with uh, an epistemic modality, then I'm conveying that I'm uh, uh, at this current moment relative to my epistemic state, um, I'm, I ought to have been in bed by, by six o'clock. I should have been in bed. I had to have been in bed by six o'clock. So that's anchored to the speech time. Um, but when we have like a root modality, a circumstantial modality, that tends to be anchored to the, the tense that uh, occurs above the verb phrase. So it can be shifted, the tense can be shifted by the tense of the verb phrase. Uh, so if I say um, I had to be in bed at, at by five o'clock, then it might be the case that relative to my obligations at that time, at the time, say, that I had to be in bed, that, you know, it was five o'clock that was the, the cutoff time. So you find this uh, mobility um, uh, uh, above the verb phrase to anchor at the time of the verb phrase uh, in this construction. So if I say, um, again, your son's wedding and I wasn't invited, um, Maybe it's the conventions, the obligations are coming from the obligations of friendship, um, and that's what's being contravened. Now, I can utter that sentence to you perfectly felicitously, even if I'm not currently your friend. It's the obligations of the past that I'm saying that you've uh, tra traversed, right? I'm saying, you know, I, I was your friend, uh, your son's wedding, uh, and I wasn't invited. 
um, and and what's oh, is that? I'll cut this I'll cut this response a bit short. Um, so I can I can tense shift the um, I can tense shift the obligations, um, which is predicted by a, a circumstantial uh, modality analysis and is not predicted by an epistemic analysis. And so I'm saying even if I really do get that intuition, but in in many of these cases it's looking like what's what's required, what's called for is that is that root interpretation. Great, thanks. Yeah, a um, lot for me to think about there. But uh, overall, the, the general project of making this processing much richer and more complicated than the standard picture, I think, is absolutely spot on. So thanks again. Thanks, Colleen. Um, Ryan, go for it. Hi, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. OK, uh, so Super interesting talk. It really does not show at all that this is your first time using a PowerPoint or anything like that. It was very uh, well done. So, <laughs> so oh, oh, I, Ryan, I, I Ryan, get, Ryan, before you go, get could you just move uh, away from the uh, um, uh, share share screen presentation? I think it would be more convenient if we can actually see. It. Did you hear me, Kate? Yeah, yeah I can. Hear. Yeah, can, can you move? Can, can you can you get away from the share screen? So, so, oh, so um, okay. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, I know what to do. Just as you were saying, uh, Ryan, that it's not obvious. I've never used a PowerPoint. I guess. <laughs> this is a Zoom thing. It's not about PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, it doesn't it doesn't matter a whole lot, Ryan. Go don't don't, don't worry, Kate. Go for, go for it, Ryan. Okay. Um. So I, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around the, the processing here. So at some point, there's there's some sort of um, interaction between the semantic and the pragmatic modules. You you assumed mentalism at the beginning. And I was just wondering, do you get, it, it, is this uh, germane to the, the project? There's some sort of underspecification happening here. Mm -hmm. And once the initial pragmatic reanalysis takes place, the underspecification is not done yet. And that's in part why the, the semantic machinery is, is brought back at that point? Um, okay, so yeah, so, something like that. So what you've got, so when you've got your surface string, you default interpret your surface string with all the kind of normal meanings. Um, then we need, in order to kind of get the, generate the interpretation that's the test, attested interpretation. Um, so, you know, the example that I keep using, um, marriage and to him. Um, that's not uh, going to give you the interpretation that's the attested interpretation. So usually what would happen, the normal story with uh, an idiomatic construction of this nature is a reanalysis story. So what you do is you pragmatically reanalyze re to get the interpreted, uh, the usual interpretation. Um, but what I'm saying is that there's just like a stage in that process, in that story, that is um, completely cross-contextually stable. So when we're doing reanalysis, at some point, we hit a phase that's cross-contextually stable. And when we've got cross-contextual cross -contextual stability uh, in interpretation, that's the hallmark of a linguistic convention. And so what I'm saying is that we represent that stage of the reanalysis by saying, well, that is something that semantics is doing. Semantics is getting involved back into the story and constraining the process of reanalysis so that it's not pragmatic all the way through. It's partially governed by a convention about how that reanalysis ought to take place. Um, so that's the kind of story. Okay, that 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 helps a lot. Uh, and and by semantics now we mean sort of this autonomous semantics because it, now the the architectural picture isn't going to be the compositional thing. The syntax isn't coming back, right? It's it's not multi-phase syntax. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the yeah right. So this is a multi-phase syntax. This is why it's been such uh, an unpopular line in semantics um, uh, to to do this kind of thing, right? There's there's reasons what I'm doing is not what other people are, are doing. It's not very popular. The reason is that you have to posit extra syntactic change. Uh, in extra syntactic semantic addition. An extra syntactic semantic addition um, is in some of its variants, common or garden, we're familiar with type shifting as extra syntactic semantic additions. But some of the type shifts that we see in order to account for production of surprising meaning or meaning that varies uh, in, its, uh, uh, in the kind of attested response to what's on the, the surface level, um, what's the default meaning, um, is, is a little bit, uh, uh, seems a little bit um, unconstrained or ad hoc. So 
know uh, familiarly, you know, the, um, the metaphor operator that just introduces a metaphorical interpretation anywhere it's needed, um, or, you know, the, um, the sense shift operator, the reference shift operator for the ham sandwich is, um, uh, the ham sandwich is getting angry. So people have been unhappy with that move of getting semantics uh, back involved extra syntactically. But I'm saying there's reason to do it here because this phase of interpretation is just behaving like semantics. And if you say that it's a pragmatic, uh, fully pragmatic reanalysis, then you're making one phase of reanalysis really shockingly systematic cross-linguistically. Um, why is pragmatic reanalysis always doing the same thing in every tokening of this construction? That's not what pragmatics is good at. Um, and so, yeah, so it's not, it's not usually argued for in this way, but it's in the same general vein as those extra semantic uh, introductions. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Mark, do you want, do you want to go? Mark Wilson. We... Yeah, good, thanks. Right. Except I'm trying to, but where is it? Oh, it's down here. But we can, we can hear you, Mark. We can't oh, see you. Right. Oh. Right. <laughs> no, no, I'm not so great on Zoom either, despite having to teach the whole bloody year. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I thought that I thought this is very interesting. And but, but some of these questions about how so-called pragmatics and semantics fit together in, in these kinds of contexts. There's a case that always made me wonder, which is about systematic, um, well, not dialogue, but model in cases where you're thinking about something and you're foreseeing that it should take a certain investigative shape. And the thing that made me think about, and this is about your friend Orr and that exclusive inclusive stuff. When you look at Boole's logic, which was geared to a certain kind of logic problem that 19th century logic books emphasized, which is you have a bunch of data and you wanna, who is the guy that murder, who is the murderer in that, that kind of puzzle. And actually people in regular modern logic can't answer those questions very efficiently, but Boole could. And because, and, but to do that, the notorious thing about Boole's logic and their interesting defenses of it is his plus, which is his or. It starts off exclusive, but in the course of manipulation turns to inclusive. And so you can add on in the later part of one of these generated, you know, looking for who the murderer is and add, or both without any problem, but you can't do it early on. Mm -hmm. And so this is so it so this is the sense if you set up a problem, and so to set up a problem bool style, you definitely want to use exclusive or for computational reasons. You want those things in those those categories. That's sort of required by the nature of the procedures you're going to engage in. But it's also required by the nature of procedures later on, you're gonna to wanna to do that crossover to inclusive one. Okay, so knowing what the saying that, as you said, it's a very minor thing. And it's in some sense, this case is more like what you're after, but it isn't clear that or has either an inclusive or it's a kind of word that we learn to use. And if when we learn to use it in this kind of context, which are very, quite frequent, then it so happens that you can only make sense truth functionally of what we're doing by saying that there's contrast is essential for, for its use in the beginning and it drops out and is cancelable later. I don't, seems related to what? Yeah, absolutely. Related. Uh, um, uh, uh, can you hear me? No, you faded there. Oh, can you hear me? Here we go. Okay, super. Yeah, this is super duper related to the big picture question um, at the beginning. So I'm gonna put some of my cards on the table here. Um, I think when we're doing semantics, um, what we do is we start with a set of questions that we're interested in, in answering. We start with a whole bunch of data that we think is friendly to help us answer those questions. Um, and then we try to develop a, a representational medium that will help us using the data to answer the questions. Um, now, I think, 
what's happened is that historically in semantics, we've started with an extremely restricted set of questions, uh, a big bias and a very small fragment. Um, and what I'm, uh, what I'm doing is, is a relatively minor thing in this talk to say we need to make some changes to the stuff that we've inherited relative to the questions we've inherited by minor extension to the data that we've inherited. Um, but I think that as you go further and further out with the set of data that you're trying to capture and the questions that you're trying to answer, we're going to need a full overhaul of the representational medium. So my, my, my big picture is that even this much, even the lambda calculus, even the type lambda calculus is ultimately going to have to go under the pressure of interpretative patterns in the data. So if you start from uh, a different set of questions, if you start from certain other kinds of behavior uh, with the logical connectives that's going to require relative, uh, in order to answer those questions, an exclusive disjunction, um, then you will find that you need to posit as, as primitive the exclusive disjunction. Whereas uh, the picture that we've inherited from use of uh, so the predicate calculus uh, enriched in various ways is that we've got to start with exclusive and we've got to do whatever we can. Uh, that's not gonna let us answer all the questions. Um, uh, we've got to kind of modify it on the spot, put pragmatics in to help block readings we don't want. Um, and I think it gets into us, all, us into all sorts of trouble. But the basic dynamic is, you know, um, what questions are we trying to answer? What subset of the data do we start with? That's going to drive what representational medium we think is appropriate. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. Siddharth, your uh, next. Hi. Uh, so, uh, well, I have a couple of questions. So the first one is, you know, so you probably anticipate this is the kind of examples that I've been working at for, with for a while. So, you know, where you basically have a uh, increasing precisification in the meaning of what we talk about in as context changes, right? And uh, uh, so, for example, this is quite of common in scientific context where sometimes you're happy with the approximate use of the term and then in a more uh, careful context, you need a more precise use. So that is a truth conditional uh, or semantic reinterpretation, right? But so I, I'm, I'm just curious about what the relation, so and whereas what you suggested, if I understand correctly, is more of an affective one, right? And uh, maybe you could say a little bit about the relation between those two different kinds of uh, updating in a way. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so let me know if I'm, I'm not kind of like meeting the question um, exactly, but um, I take it as a kind of open in invitation to talk about the parallels there. Um, okay, so, well, you know, in this case, what happens is when you insert this little bit of semantics, the semantic shell that says uh, affective reaction to an incongruity judgment, um, that is supposed to be the part of the meaning that is consistent cross-contextually. The thing that's inserted at every context, uh, whatever else the, the construction is going to mean. What is it about? Is it conjoining you know, um, uh, uh, marriage and an individual? Is it conjoining smell and paper flowers? What's happening there? Um, but the consistent core is affective reaction to an incongruity judgment. And that's a template meaning, right? Um, so the template meaning isn't going to tell you what's incongruous, why it's incongruous, or what the affect expressed is. And so what semantics is inserting by means of this type shift is a template. And then the template will get con contextually precisified. So cross-contextually stable part is just templative. And I don't even know if templative is a word, um, but uh, it's a template. Um, and so I wonder, I wonder what you think, you know, about the, the potential parallel to scientific discourse. Do you think there's a possibility for semantic templates uh, to be the, the relevant cross-contextually cross -contextually stable semantic values, and for those things to admit of truth conditional modification uh, across contexts? So instead of saying we just want, we want semantics to give us a, a, a fully specified value, we want it to give an underspecified value. That's what we want. Why do we want that? Because we want the ability to refine as we need to. We need that open texture in order to uh, make the uh, interpretation that we uh, resolve on in a current, uh, current context or in a particular scientific context uh, amenable to its function uh, in that context. I see. Yeah, I guess I need to understand better what uh, a semantic template really is. Uh, so, 
yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 actually. So just to, just to, I mean, that's uh, much less um, uh, esoteric, I think, than it seems. It just means there's a big set of affect that it could express, um, and you need to pick out in the context what affect it's going to express. So it's a template in that sense that there's a kind of like, you know, pick pick from this set of affects. Um, I see. That semantics needs to do that. Um, okay. That's just contextual resolution, which we find across the board in uh, in, in semantics. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Yeah. So I guess I, I was curious whether this is this way of going is the standard way of going in the truth conditional ways, uh, sort of parallel cases here, not just about like forgetting science, just ordinary language as well, right? Where you know you say that he stalled or something, and then uh, in one context that you might think that sure, but then you learn that you know you're in a room of basketball players, so you you have to sort of change the truth condition of that would, would you give a template based account of that kind of yeah, context so, shift right so there's nothing really i think there's nothing really um kind of groundbreaking about the actual tools that i use the only thing that's different is the fact that i'm having semantics come in twice um so if there's uh some consistent step in interpretation uh, that everyone shares, that everyone does, and that seems to be operating after reanalysis has kicked in, that would be strange. But then, you know, the independent question um, about how meaning resolution in context is happening um, is, is, is kind of split into people who think semantics gives you a fully specified meaning that can then be reworked, and those who think semantics only gives you uh, an underspecified meaning, and that has to be fleshed out in context. Um, so different people fall into either of those two camps. And I'm falling into the camp of, you know, I don't really mind what semantics is, uh, is, is giving us. What I'm saying is that thing needs reanalysis, and that reanalysis is conventionally constrained. Um, so that's the kind of basic play. And the information about the thing that needs reanalysis is obtained by the, uh, the affective sort of information, right? Like you mentioned the prosody and the context. It, I, I guess I'm just trying to understand what is it that's driving the fact that you need the reanalysis? So what's driving the fact about that you need the reanalysis is that you know you're you're in a context you're trying to gather uh, what the speaker is trying to communicate to you. So you're trying to retrieve speaker meaning, and the speaker says something whose literal meanings, when you put them together, don't designate you know don't uh, uh, you know uh, signify a proposition. So you don't get a proposition out of um, uh, Shadi Ardi six. So you don't get proposition there. Um, so you have to do something in order to get a meaning out of it, be it propositional or, or non prop You need something to understand. Um, and at that point, you need to start changing up the interpretations of the parts, doing something further to reformat it. Um, my claim is that the way that you're doing that is by reanalysis, uh, by locally supplementing the meanings of the parts. And then there's going to be a stage of that local supplementation that is going to proceed along uh, a conventional path. Um, and that's the point where the semantics is coming back in. Um, but you can know about it exactly as you mentioned, because, you know, the speaker is clearly uh, a, a fluent speaker. Um, the speaker is uh, speaking with an affective uh, disposition or, you know, facts about the context or, you know, the um, uh, something about the tag phrase has been used like Chalbag, and then the sentence is used or the construction is used. Um, so something about the context feeds you uh, enough uh, information to tell you this isn't a nonsense string do something to these literal meanings to make them understandable. Uh, and then the story that I've been telling you is that what you do and, and kind of when you do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sidas. Um, we have a couple of minutes if someone has another question. Um, yeah, Colleen is back with us. So Colleen, let me just bring you back. All right, well. If we've got a second round, so oh, Colleen, go, go for it, Colleen. All right, thanks. Um, great, thanks again. So your answer to the last question reminded me of what I'm less... So, so you talk about what the speaker has to do. Um, and of course, that makes it sound very deliberate and intentional. But all of this is happening at a subpersonal level. And intuitively, it seems that the actual interpretation of these phrases is much more automatic and um, uh, and doesn't involve sort of any delay where you first figure out that the speaker can't mean what they literally said and then have to do this, uh, any kind of reanalysis or, you know, in the other account disambiguation. And I'm just wondering to what extent there's 
you know, psycholinguistic evidence that there is um, the, the, the set of stages that, that is part of your account. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what I've just done is I've told you an absolute, um, you know, just so story about what's happening here, right? So the, um, the process that I've told you, I've told you as though an individual is thinking through each of these stages, but obviously that's not the case. Um, and this isn't even in the most case kind of cognitively penetrable. Um, so there's some really, I'm taking my cue here um, from uh, some really interesting recent work uh, um, by uh, Beth Levin um, and others on the interpretation of idiom um, uh, and in particular indication that what's happening when we're interpreting idiomatic strings is that we're taking the default meaning and we're re-representing it. So we're doing something like reanalysis, we're re-representing it uh, so that both the default meaning is available and the reanalyzed meaning uh, uh, is available. So reanalysis being something which is happening uh, uh, cognitively um, as we're interpreting. Um, so uh, I think although the process, I'm really not talking about a kind of temporal progression, there is psycholinguistic evidence that reanalysis occurs during uh, uh, idiom interpretation and this is a partially idiomatic string so I'm allowing it to fall under uh, that uh, prior work um, uh, but the temporality element isn't really supposed to be taken literally what's happening is I'm really just saying well there are different ways that semantics can enter into interpretation and when we've got conventional meaning we really ought to be talking about semantics however the actual temporal story plays out nevertheless I do think that there's reason to think that we might be doing something like a representation uh, when we're uh, computing idioms cognitively. Um, so, you know, it's uh, kind of the, 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 the standard pinch of salt when telling things that sound like they're, you know, like uh, intentional processes in, in uh, personal psychology. Yeah, great. I mean, I'd be happy to carry on the discussion, but I see Ryan's there and we've, we're getting low on time, right, Edward? Yeah, we, are, we have three more minutes and we're going to stop. So let's, okay. let's go for Ryan. And Thanks, thanks, Colleen, for, for, for showing up again. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Uh, so quick, quick question. Uh, what was your thinking with the incongruity judgment? Because you were talking about presuppositions. Is it some sort of Asher picture? Is it, it's it, the types coming from the, the lexicon? What's the relationship between that operation and, uh, and like category mistakes? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not assuming any kind of like um, uh, heavily structured type system. Um, I'm really just having that this this thing enter as uh, as an actually. So it's like this is a little bit um, controversial, I suppose. It's kind of an optional type shifter. So it's an extra semantic change which comes in uh, triggered by pragmatic reanalysis, and along with the type shift, um, it's going to bring two pieces of information. One of them is just going to come in as a, a descriptive presupposition. Um, and so the presupposition is not built into the construction. The presupposition is coming along with the type shifter. So I don't need a really complicated um, uh, type, type system. Whatever the final story might be, it might be that Ash is like totally right. This is exactly what we want. Um, but I just don't need it to tell the story at this level of detail. Thank you. All right, I think we're going to be uh, stopping here for uh, today. Thank you, I think, on behalf of uh, everyone who attended this really great lecture and uh, really interesting Q&A. Thanks, Kat. And um, uh, we hope to see um, all of you, um, uh, or most of you anyway, next week for the uh, coming talks at the center. Have a good weekend. Thanks again for this great lecture. Bye, guys.